a good morning to everybody. Uh, it's fun to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, about two, basically two broad topics. Uh, I was asked by the organizers and uh, uh, through Bernardo and others that there were really two things that I should share. One, if I could, to give us some sense about how at Google we, really how we do marketing, how we try to build brands, how we try to reach new customers. Uh, I don't know that that will be uh, prescriptive for you because uh, you know we're all in different businesses a little bit, but um, I'll tell you what we do. We do a lot of strange things and we look at things a little bit differently. Maybe thinking about that uh, would help you. Just uh, think and then uh, maybe it's totally wrong or totally right. That'd make, that would make good questions. And you, I'll be taking questions later and feel free to challenge me on that. Uh, I also was asked to talk a little bit about things that are happening in the world that might affect uh, travel and tourism in the internet in ways that maybe Google has insight about. I'm going to talk about that as well. So those are the two broad areas. Okay, let's get started. to see what I say after that, because you can't get that part on Google. I haven't done it yet. Uh, the thing I want to talk about first on the, on the Google front is, is just to have you understand that Google's actually a very simple company. We have one and only one action, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. We do that in every decision that we take. We do that in every investment that we make, every person that we hire, every every uh, policy we create or change, it's directed to this goal. And so that's the first uh, Google search screen there. Obviously, we've gotten different in 10 years, but not, not all that different. You know, it looks different, but actually looks the same. And uh, uh, the, the things about the mission statement that are interesting are the idea of, uh, like, the worlds means all the worlds. And uh, universally accessible means, uh, basically, even if you were in Egypt or even if you were blind, even if you only spoke Swahili, okay? And useful, uh, it's a little bit softer, but, but the way I take that is, um, like if you were uh, looking for a school, like a school for your children, you might do research, uh, just a list of references would be good. But if you had just been stabbed and you, you need to go to a doctor, you really wouldn't want to know the best doctor in Canada, you want to know the closest doctor to where you are, right? Because you might not make it to the second closest doctor. And so in that case, maybe a map, would be a better way to see that because it would be more useful, right? And so there's, there's, a, there's a contextual representation of information sometimes that makes it be useful. So just all the data isn't enough. You need the data in a way you can act on sometimes. So, so the, all three of those things are things we think about a lot, and uh, they make our job pretty hard. I'll give you a sense of that. These are, these are some kinds of devices you might need to use to receive information. Uh, these are some modes of information communication, like a drawing or uh, textual, images, photo, you know, photos, video. Uh, here's some, some kinds of languages you might get the information in. Like, uh, let's say you were searching for, um, um, well, let me, let me go a little further. Let's say you, 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 you saw uh, the dance of the sugar plum fairy and you wondered exactly how the, uh, how the toe was positioned. Well, how would you search for that? You know, think about that. I mean, there's like a language for like foot positions or gestures. And if you've seen like Balinese dance, you know what it looks like. But how would you search for that? You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of things that we are still very bad at or we just completely don't do. And uh, our competitors or other people don't do either. So there, a great deal of human uh, understanding and experience is uh, not online. It's not indexed. It's not searchable. It's not uh, researchable. Basically, there's a, just a set of things that are online. It seems like everything, but that's just because it's on the front page. But there's also the whole rest of the newspaper that's like not online, so to speak. And we're trying to, trying to, trying to aspire to do that. So that's the, that's the everything part. Um, now, I want to give you an example. I, uh, when I'm not uh, working, I'm on boats. And I was on this boat. And uh, it's pretty nice, actually. Um, it's, it, what is it? It's... Uh, 87 meters, 90 meters, you know, so it's pretty, pretty big, actually. Um, 
And it, and it was pretty expensive, and, and the people were proud of it and showing it off. And I actually hated it. I'll tell you why. So, so it's kind of cool, though. Um, on the back, that's the, on the aft deck there, there's a swimming pool, the VDA swimming pool with a glass wall looking out into the ocean. And the bottom of it's a hydraulic, it comes up, and it's a helicopter landing pad for a Eurocopter EC-135. It's, it's like that kind of boat, you know? But um, with all that effort, it was so shocking. I went inside, and the, it has six, six uh, guest bedrooms. Eat, they're all cream colored, but they have different uh, accent colors. Like one has red pillows, one has green pillows, one has blue pillows. And the, the bookcase in every room has books on it that are the color of the pillows in the room. OK, so there was like a, there was like a, a red room. It had the red, pillow, red books and the red pillows. And there's a blue room. There's a green room. And there, there was a white room. It had white uh, books. So, so, so that's organized, right? But it's not useful. I mean, it, it, it's, it's inconceivable. You would say, I want to read a green book, <laughs> right? You know the expression about judging a book by its cover, right? Well, this is exactly that. This guy's got enough money to buy this boat, and he, he just wants to read a green book today, right? So um, my suspicion was he doesn't read at all. He just put them there like wallpaper. Um, so that isn't the kind of organization that Google's about, OK? Just taking something and sorting it by size or by color or you know, by left-handed versus right, this, this is stupid, OK? So that's not what we do. We're trying to get insightful information. You know, all the emergency medical books in one place and all the recipe books in one place would be a lot more reasonable, I would think. So don't buy that boat until they change the books. Um, another thing that Google has sort of morphed into a little bit, you know, we started with Google search. And, and let me explain to you how search works, because I, I think that's maybe not known. When you do a Google search, I mean, I mean, or presumably a Bing search or whatever, I'm not being particular, but when you, when you do a Google search, what happens is you type in text, you know, a little box, and you hit go. And what actually happens is that your text goes off to Google, uh, goes to, the, to, to a search data center, and it actually goes to maybe 20,000 computers, 50,000 computers, all of them, which collectively have index of the entire internet in memory, and all of them look, do your, their part of your search in parallel and give the answers back to one computer that kind of weaves it together to make a little web page, and you, you get shown that. So when you hit enter at Google, when you do a search, you're doing one of the world's largest parallel computations. It's like weather forecasting for national governments or nuclear missile testing or something. It's, it's, it's that kind of computation. But it only takes a few hundred thousandths of a second, and then we're on to the next person. So to build it, to build, we had to do it that way, just, just because. It's not important to you probably why. But uh, I mean, it was, it's interesting to me. I'm a programmer, but I mean, to you probably not. But, but uh, because we had to build this kind of ridiculously huge computer system and then share it for tiny fractions of a second with millions and millions of people, uh, we ended up with kind of like more computer than we need at the time when people are sleeping. People aren't using computers and awake uniformly around the world 24 hours a day. So there's busy times and light times. And sometimes we have like extra computer power. And so we, we, we thought, well, you know, we have like, like this picture here on the left side, you can see two, um, two data centers there uh, on the Columbia River. I mean, they, they have a 40 megawatt cooling tower. You know, think of it that way. Okay, it's a big data centers. And we thought, well, you know, what can we do with all that uh, computing power, you know, when we're not searching for things, we could do something good. Um, and so uh, maybe six years ago, I started thinking about that. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So who knows what this is? It's a Rosetta Stone. And this is, what I did was I took the English version. I used Google Translate. I translated it into 51 languages in less than a minute, the whole text. So that's something that you can do it's a you know, language to language translation. It's the highest quality in the world, uh, but it's, it's still not good for poetry, but I mean, it's good enough to tell which way the bathroom is. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it takes a lot of computing power to do that. You know? it, takes, it takes a lot of resources to do that. So it's one of those things where uh, you know, a simple t phrase comes in, all these computers do their magic, and then the result comes back uh, fast enough that we actually have a system now where you can do text messages translated. So like in Haiti, people get Haitian Creole, and you get you know, Canadian French, and they ask questions like, 
is this rash normal for my baby? And you say, well, check here, check there. And, and you can actually have doctors here doing help there, and they don't speak the same language, and it's being translated both ways as they send little text messages. So, so there's a lot of computing behind the scenes to make that happen. It's, it's, it's not just um, like in the library where they say, oh, the book's on that shelf, and they run and get the book for you. It, it's like they get the book and they translate it into Aramaic. You know, it, it, there's something... There's something going on behind the scenes. And so we're really excited to try to find ways to do ever more of that. Uh, there's one, if you have an, uh, uh, an Android phone, or if you have, um, if you have the Google application on, on, on the iPhone, um, then you can do speech recognition. So you just want to send a message. You hit, you hit the little picture of the, little mic, the old-timey 1940s microphone. Which I think is a funny that that was our idea for what a good icon was. And then you talk into it and it, tra it translates into text. And so you just talk into it and it works. It works very good, actually. So that's, that's something interesting because there's about 300,000, uh, a little bit more than that, uh, Android activations every day. So there's 300,000 more people talking at it in whatever language they use and then correcting it. And since we get to see both parts, we improve our automatic translations. So we have hundreds of millions of people using phone developing a translation facility just as they use it. That's the kind of thing that's happening now in computing. And here's the one I want you to watch this. This is interesting. Hey, I'm Casey, hey. software engineer at Google. And today, I'm going to try to be the Sudoku master at our own game. <laughs> or actually, this phone's going to beat her using Google goggles. to you? Not bad. So that's not made up. That's real. If any of you have an Android phone, you have an Android phone? Okay, you can install something called Google Goggles. And what Goggles does is use the camera and the phone to take pictures of things. And if you take a picture of a Coca-Cola can, it'll say Coca-Cola. And if you click, it'll take you to the website. And if you take a picture of a you know, sweet and low packet, it'll say, oh, that's sweet and low. Um, if you take a picture of a Sudoku puzzle, it'll recognize there's lines and there's numbers. It'll say, oh, it's a, you know, a nine by nine Sudoku. And it'll figure out what the numbers are. And it'll put the picture up on the screen of what that puzzle is, just, just, the, just the puzzle as you show it with the camera. And there's a little button called solve. And it'll go off to Google. It'll solve it. And it'll come back. OK? Now, it's, it's not that that's somehow how you should do the puzzle. I mean, I, I, I travel and do these books of extra hard ones all the time, so it's fun for me. But, um, it's important, this is, we did this because we try to explain to people what's going on and with this supercomputing in the background, people don't understand. So here's what I'm trying to understand. If, if you took a picture with your camera, your regular camera, of a Sudoku puzzle, would your camera know it was a Sudoku puzzle? Right? No, right, okay? A lot of things have lines on them and numbers, okay? So you have to look at it pretty carefully to figure out that it's got parallel lines, you know, perpendicular lines, it's got this grid, it's got numbers that go from one to nine, or if it's a 16 by 16, if, if, it's, if it's a four by four, one, then it's good, so, you know, one through 16 or one through F. So it's, it's, uh, it's basically looking at the picture and understanding what it means. Once you understand what it means, uh, then doing the obvious thing, which is solve the puzzle. And it does that basically instantly. So that's, that's an interesting kind of thing. It's just like the translation. The, the, taking the picture on the phone is nothing. So if you've got, if you've got a phone and you haven't done this, you have to do it because it's pretty impressive to yourself just to see this. Take a picture of that and it says, oh, that's a seven. You know, it's, it's, a, it's pretty, pretty fun. So th that, that kind of thing is happening more and more where something powerful happens off somewhere in the cloud or off at some data center or off in some server and your phone, your whatever it is, gets the result. 
And the most important part of that is covering the last mile. So this, these are some examples uh, from my world. The upper left is the uh, dashboard from the Audi A8 limousine. If you buy an A8 limousine with a 12-cylinder engine, uh, you get Google Earth as your navigation system. Uh, and the key is that you know, there's still all the rest of it off in the cloud somewhere, but it, it's sending Wi-Fi data to your car. Uh, if you fly on a Virgin Atlantic or Virgin America, you get uh, either one, you get Google Maps in your, in your airplane seat back. Um, if you have an iPhone, you get the nice maps people like. All of those are doing something clever somewhere that's not on the device. The device is just the, like a telephone. You know, mom's not in the phone. You know, just, just the speakers in the phone. Mom's somewhere else, you know. So, so that's what's happening with this computing. There's something remote. It's not just remote. It's, it's brilliantly smart and remote. And it can do really good things for you. And that's, that's what we're working on. Now, uh, another thing uh, is how do we do innovation at Google? Google's a pretty innovative company, uh, a lot of innovative companies. So let me tell you how, what, what, we, what we think about is, is we try to think about what users want. We, we don't sit in a room and think, for example, uh, what would the gross margin be on a product that had this characteristic? You know, what, what would the ROI be? We don't, we don't think about that. That's like forbid, forbidden words. Uh, we don't think like, what are competitors doing? We don't, we don't, we, we just say, okay, like, what do people want that they don't have? And usually, that's really hard to do. Because if it's easy, 100 people are doing it. So what, what would be cool and great to have that seems just too hard to do? Let's do that. You know, I mean, I mean seriously. So, so I'm not saying, I don't want you all go to business doing something ridiculous because I told you that. But I mean, you know, if you have the only resort that happens to have a, a helicopter and you can fly people up to the top and they can ski down, maybe that's like a, people would go there because of that. I don't know. Maybe your cousin is a helicopter pilot. You know, I mean, I, it, it, like, that's the kind of thing we're thinking, well, what would, be, what would be fabulous? And then could we build that? And then once we build it, like, can we make a business out of it or not? Is, is how we do things. Um, and the reason for that is it's real important because you, you uh, there's something called cognitive dissonance that happens. If, if you, if you uh, say you only had a, uh, if you didn't have a, a shovel and you didn't have a, uh, a, a backhoe, all you had was a spoon, it would never occur to you to make a swimming pool in your yard. Because if you thought, I want to swim, you look at the spoon, you think, it's just, it's just not worth it. You know, I, I, just, I, don't, want to, I don't want to swim that bad. You know? But, but, but if, you, if you wanted a swimming pool, all you had was a spoon, you think, I need to make a bigger spoon. And you can invent the shovel, right? So, so, so you have to kind of, kind of, basically, you have to believe it before you can see it. If you only try to build the things you can see how to build, like if you look at the Lego blocks and say, well, what does that look like? Well, it doesn't look like anything yet because you haven't made like a Spider-Man out of it yet. You know what I mean? It, it, the, you have to see it before you do it. So we focus on users and, uh, rather than advertisers, so don't take it personally. And then uh, we focus on the problem uh, that, that needs to be solved. And, and in particular, uh, Sergey is really big on this. Uh, he forces people to do the best possible solution. So if there's like 10 ways to do it and one's like really hard, but it seems like it's the ultimate way, that's the way. No other way is acceptable. Um, and we try to focus on the value that the thing would bring to people. So obviously, for example, if I could, uh, I don't know, if, if we could make your photos look better, uh, you know, your teeth whiter and your hair shinier, that, that's, that's useful, I guess. But if you like, your baby was dying and you needed medical advice and the only doctor spoke a different language and we could do translation for you, that's really valuable. Right? That's really valuable. So we're telling you, well, that would be valuable. Not like, why don't you pay us for it? It's not that. It's just like, you, you wouldn't want to live in a world without it once you knew it existed. That kind of value. So we, we, we think about that. Like, uh, you know, hotels with indoor plumbing, that kind of thing. You know, real, real value, you know? I mean, there, there are things like that, you know, that you think, well, if I do that, that'll change everything. That's what we want to do.